Good day, everyone. Welcome to Footyology Final Siren, wrapping up tonight's second semi final between Geelong and GWS. The upshot Geelong through to yet another preliminary final, their 11th preliminary final appearance in the last 15 years. What an amazing side they've been, at least in far, insofar as uh, making it through to the final two weeks of the season is concerned for the Giants. Well, it's all over for them after what I think even their uh, fiercest critics would have to admit it was a pretty brave campaign. Been on the road a long time. Didn't even look like making the finals a few weeks ago, but uh, really finished off the season competitively. Even tonight, they just hung in there, even though they were clearly undermanned. Obviously, the loss of Toby Green, pretty huge for them. But the Cats, well, what sort of shape are they in headed into a preliminary final against Melbourne? Incidentally, those two teams have met in a preliminary final before back in 1954. Uh, Melbourne were the victors on that occasion and played the Bulldogs in the grand final. Perhaps that's an omen all these years later. Anyway, we'll talk about the game. We'll talk about what's ahead. Talk about tomorrow night's game. And anything you want to put on the Footyology Final Siren Agenda, get your questions in now. As you can see, we're live streaming now with the difference. You can see your questions coming through. So we're going to try and keep up with them. That's going to be difficult, but we'll do our best. As I say, very good evening to my co-host, Mark Fine. What do you make of the Cats tonight, Finey? Well, you've got to give them, you know, you've got to pay due respect to Chris Scott and the Geelong Football Club for making another preliminary final. I don't know whether they do so in the sort of nick that will be able to compete with Melbourne, who seem to have sort of the kryptonite to their supermen. And we'll go through the best players shortly, but their supermen are up front. And I've got a feeling that Lever and May might be able to counter them. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. What interests me the most tonight, though, Rowan, was... GWS, you're brave, I think is the word you use. They leave this season with an immeasurable that we can measure for once and for all, and that is more character than I think we've given them credit for in the past, and that'll stand them in great stead in the future. So I dips my lid to Leon Cameron and his men, and we'll see what these ageing warriors, which at times Geelong look like, but they've got canny heads on their shoulders, can do next week. All right, well, let's get straight into the details. I think we've got the quarter-by-quarter quarter scores ready to go. And uh, pretty uh, dour stuff in the first half, you've got to say. Just eight goals kicked to half time. Uh, the Cats always managing to have their noses in front. They went by 14 points at the first break, 15 points at half time, 5 8 to 3 5. Uh, comparatively, Freya scoring second half, in fact, uh, 17 goals kicked in the second half. Ten by the Cats, seven to the Giants. The Cats, five each in the third and fourth quarters. So that lead was out to a very handy 32 points at the last change. In fact, it was 38 just before Shane Mumford kicked a goal on the three-quarter time siren. Geelong never really threatened. GWS, to their credit, they did launch a bit of a run at them in the last quarter. Three goals in a matter of three minutes. Bought the margin back to 20 points. Must say, I, I never felt they were going to get a lot closer, though, and uh, predictably, perhaps, the Cats steadied with three of the last four goals to run out winners in the end by 35 points. The final scores, 15-13, 103 Geelong, defeating GWS 10-8-68. Let's have a look at the goal kickers. Well, that man, Tom Hawkins, you can't keep him down too many weeks in a row. He hit back with a vengeance tonight. Five goals to him, tower of strength up in that forward line. Two to Cameron, two to Rowan, two to Close. Good game by him tonight, I thought. Two to Menegola, singles to Radigalia and Smith for the Giants. Two goals to Stone, two to Himmelberg, singles to Kelly, Lloyd, Hill, Mumford, Haynes and Ward. The best, as voted by you, Mark Fine, Hawkins, BOG, Zach Tui. What a return to senior football that was. Gave him a heap of drive off halfback. Cam Guthrie getting amongst it again after a quiet one last week. Ditto, Sam Metagola, Smith and Cameron for the Giants. You've gone Hopper, Haynes, Mumford in what may well be his last game of AFL football. Kelly, Whitfield and DeBoer. 
<coughs> pardon me, who did a pretty decent tagging job on Paddy Dangerfield. Um, let's get straight into the questions. We've got a few comments here. So obviously with the questions scrolling up, we're going to be a little more selective, but uh, I'll read some comments. Dave Batley says, can't see Geelong beating Melbourne next week. Trout from Wood End says, the Giants just so undermanned and it cost them big time. Brad Way, he reckons Hawkins is going to be suspended. We'll come back to that one. I'll ask you your thoughts on that in a minute, Finey. David Hayley says, good win by the Cats. Narkel comes in for Parfit next week. Not confident we'll beat Melbourne, but you'll never know. I want to have a chat about that too, because I wouldn't be jumping to too many conclusions about tonight. A uh, bit of debate there about whether Hawkins will get suspended or not. Uh, pathetic umpiring says, Hayden Murdoch, all the Cats way. Is Selwood in trouble with his swinging forearm to the neck of Haynes, says Trav Dupka. Uh, Matt Crowley, Ferguson, Zach Tui coming up a treat, fresh as Duncan did last week. Uh, Bo Kelly, disappointed with the free Toby signs. He's written Tony, but I'm presuming that means uh, Toby. Dan Francher loves the new format. Uh, we do too, Dan, and that's all the work of our wonder producer, Damon Jackman. So well done, Damon. Jason got a query on Paddy Dangerfield. Not good again. Slow, boring, typical Geelong. Not going to work in these last two weeks. Uh, Kate, good day, Kate, wants our thoughts on Gary Rowan. Thought he played a much better final tonight. All right, Finey, quick answers from you on the following. Hawkins, will he get suspended? I barely know what we're talking about. Uh, is it the 50-metre penalty? There's nothing that he'll get suspended for tonight. I must say, I can't remember. No, there's nothing leaping to mind for me, so uh, I must have been looking away at that moment, but I, I maybe someone can refresh our memory. Uh, what about Gary Rowan tonight? I thought he was pretty instrumental early in the game. Yeah, but he does look very slow when he gets... He worked really hard, but when he gets the ball, he just sort of freezes, and he got tackled early, free kick against him for holding the ball. He, for a player that is fleet of foot, he's a bit stodgy now when he gets the ball. I can I, I can see why he struggles in finals, but he did try much harder tonight. He got a little Joe the Goose that took him to two goals, so there was a return there. Uh, Bo Kelly querying your best finding. No Taranto? No. He had a very good last quarter, but he would have only had 12 possessions up till then. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, calling it up. Uh, he had 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, he would have had eight yeah. in the last quarter. Okay, fair enough. Uh, it's a very subjective thing, the best. I concede that. Uh, Radagalia, important to their structures, says 16 4 1. Yeah, well, as Daisy Pierce correctly points out, when your second ruckman is a key backman, that's disruptive. So, at least in terms, then we're talking blitzarves there, at least in terms of running him in the ruck, it worked all right. He took that very Impressive mark and an important mark prior to half time and kicked truly. So that's a return, I would have thought. I thought he, I thought he was all right. And what, what, what is hard to measure just watching, particularly on TV, is how much pressure he is absorbing and how much that is allowing Hawkins to just have one opponent rather than two. Yep. Um, and no doubt about it, Hawkins really got the better of uh, young Sam Taylor tonight, really reversed. Uh, the win that Taylor had over him in that round 21 game. So I think that was, a, in, in, in a way, a sort of important reconnaissance mission for Geelong. I thought they just they got their flow going better tonight. They still played a slow, methodical game, but I thought they tried harder to get that overlap coming off half-back, and that's where Tui is so critical. And it's interesting, we've talked a lot about Stewart, but we really... Forgot to talk about that in conjunction with the loss of Tui. And that robbed them of two good rebounders and interceptors. And their defence was a lot more sturdy tonight, didn't you think? Oh, it certainly functioned far better, didn't it? Isaac Smith got back there as well to offer some important clean kicking disposals out of the back line. But it was Zach Tui that gave him a run and gun out of the back line. I thought Buse started well defensively. And generally, the back line worked, again, with Blitzarves just able to concentrate on his job. But let's be honest, Rowan, you won't come up against a more, um, well, let's just say, uh, 
hamstrung, even though it was not hamstring, it was a calf to Hogan and a suspension to Toby Green, forward line than that, because really, Perryman was the man, um, sorry, Himmelberg was the man to hold. They held him until the last quarter. He bobbed up with a couple. But that's not really the sort of forward line you've normally come up in against, against in a final, What is it? I mean, it was pretty a patchy sort of forward line with Sproul and various others required to do filling jobs. It was a pity, really, because, uh, you know, I felt only in the last couple of weeks they got some sort of structure back and you had a few different goal-kicking avenues there and, and then it was sort of back to how they've battled through much of the season. Now, Robert Rice has got a question directed specifically to you, Finey. Does Luke Dalhouse get a second chance next week for Parfit or will they go with Narkel? Who would you pick? Narkel. And Narkel was in poor form coming in. But as you pointed out, Close did a good job at the fall of the ball. So did Myers. Oh, poor Maxie, that fresh air kick. That would have been better if he, if he kicked it. But you know what? Yeah. He provided some run in the last quarter as well. I think he was a bit nervous, but he certainly has the aerobic ability and the nice size about him. I can see why they play him. I think he holds a spot. Um, I, I know I'm biased on him, but I, I thought the touches he had tonight, aside from that goal square incident, where he did sort of, he was sort of put off balance, but I thought he had some pretty good touches tonight. Is he, there was one shocker. Yeah, no, there was a shocker going inside that 50. He's constructed with his handball. I think he's got a decent football brain. He did look a bit nervous, though, but I, I'm hopeful he'll hold his spot, put it that way. But as I say, for a youngster, very strong aerobically. I thought he got a couple of important touches in the last quarter when Geelong were running in quicksand a bit. And I want to talk about that later on in terms of how they're going to try and match up in the midfield against Melbourne. But no, I, I don't think Dalhouse makes his way back in the team. And I tell you who dis was disappointed tonight. Now, I know I said Cornelio isn't in their best 22. And on tonight's form, he's not in their best 22. Uh, yeah, uh, well, we've got six months to uh, to mull over that one, I suppose. A uh, few, I'll zip through a few more. Uh, Ben Fenton Smith says Melbourne private schools were only mentioned three times. Disappointed? Well, Ben, your name sounds like you went to a private school. Um, every, every time Connor Stone got the ball. I did hear a couple of St. Kevin's references. BT, pretty liberal with his use of them as well. Um, uh, Jeff Lord says, am I the only one who feels like this result and season overall is like Groundhog Day for Geelong? What do you reckon, Fiona? Is your gut feel right now they're going to get munched next week by the Demons? Yep. Okay. You know, when they came back at half time to the Fox coverage of the game, I think Nick Rewald hit, it, hit the nail on the head with the first thing he said. And that was, I don't think Melbourne's going to lose too much sleep over either of these two teams. And the reason is, look, full credit to Geelong, but they were playing against a bit of a patchwork team in the finish. And I was concerned about Geelong in that last quarter because GWS did come at them and G that midfield troika is the term that you like of Dangerfield, uh, Selwood and who else was well, maybe? Guthrie, Menegola. Probably Guthrie, mainly. Guthrie, fine. Selwood and Dangerfield really struggled and they whipped the ball out of that middle two or three times. That's when Taranto was playing well. I thought Hopper was good all night. And Mumford, well, he was doing a pretty good job by the end. So I just thought at that point, if they're coming up against Petrarca and Oliver with assistance from Viney and, and others, I don't know how they're going to compete out of the middle, right? No, I think it's a very valid point. I don't think there are a chance if Selwood and Dangerfield play like they played tonight. I want to make this point, though that I think often the semi-finals are the poorest games of a final series. And you do tend to see blowouts and you do tend to see one side really doing enough and the side that is losing sort of know they're cooked and, you know, they, they start feeling the pinch. And that was sort of how that game transpired. In. One thing I want to say about Geelong, and I think people seem to agree that Geelong are a very ordinary side to watch and I think a lot of the time they can be however don't forget they are still capable of hanging on to that handbrake and releasing it at will 
And they've done it a couple of times. And one of the times, probably their most impressive burst of single burst of football the entire season came in that infamous loss to Melbourne when they were 44 points up. Now, in that third quarter, when they kicked eight goals to one or two, they kicked five goals in eight minutes in that quarter of footy. I've seen them do it to Brisbane last year up at the Gabba. I saw them do it to Brisbane twice, actually, because they did it to it uh, to them in the preliminary final. Don't think that Geelong isn't capable of scoring rapidly and in a hurry. Can they do that against Melbourne? I, I'm with you. I don't think they're a chance unless Dangerfield and Selwood play to a much higher level and Menegola, Guthrie, um, ex, uh, Meta, uh, sorry, Menegola, Guthrie, et cetera, are at least as good as they are tonight. But I wouldn't look at this game and say, well, Geelong ordinary last week, not super impressive tonight. They're cooked. I don't think finals work like that. I would not be surprised if Geelong gay came out all guns blazing next week and won. I won't be tipping them, but I won't be surprised if they win. Yeah, well, they're going, they've got so much experience on their side. Melbourne are within touching distance of the Holy Grail. So there's going to be, and as you say, notoriously preliminary finals are close and nervy affairs for the favourites. And in that case, you know, the longer the game goes without a, a, a clear, decisive break that Melbourne would be looking for as favourites, the more you back the experience out that to come home with a wet sail, wet sail. Just have a look at Tom Hawkins tonight. I mean, if Geelong are within sniffing distance of Melbourne halfway through that last quarter, kicking it up to Hawkins is probably going to be the best option either team will have going forward late in the game. It's whether or not Geelong can be in a position to make good on that, given how strong... Look, I was thinking about it. I really reckon Melbourne have got three of the best 10 players in the midfield, Gorn this season. Gorn, Petrarca and Oliver are three of the top players in the AFL. That measures up very well, especially against... What you say now is a disappointing Selwood and Dangerfield and Stanley and Guthrie. It's just going to be hard to compete against that powerhouse middle of the ground for Melbourne. No doubt about that. Just on the Geelong forward line, Ben Healy has some observations. He says if the Cats play Radical Air next week, then he, Rowan, Cameron, Hawkins could stretch the D's defence. Weaver might have to play more man on man and be less damaging. I reckon that's a really good point. Yeah, but by the same token, if they're not winning the ball in the air, they're going to see it whipped away very quickly with that sort of forward line. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, absolutely. Aerially, that will test any back line. But I think Melbourne's got the best two tall defenders in the competition that work together. And what happens when the ball hits the ground if you've got those four guys up there? Well, that's. I mean, that's... a the trick for the Cats, isn't it? It's not to let the ball hit the ground, it's to hold on to their marks. Um, yeah, look, it, it can work either way, can't it? Uh, Willem Van Denderen Willem who? Willem Van Denderen says <laughs> men are very quiet the past two weeks, but was huge tonight, super important. Right. And I think he'll be perhaps arguably more important against the Ds because the Ds have such a strong body midfield. In fact, that's the one area where I think Geelong can match Geelong's midfield group is in that physical strength component. You know, the Ds, I don't know. They, I don't know if they necessarily get enough credit for how physically strong that midfield is. You look at Oliver and, you know, he's not super built, but he's a strong physical player. Petrarca obviously is. Uh, Viney is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think you look at, you look at Menegola particularly. He is a bull, Menegola. Guthrie's very strong over the ball. Dangerfield, Selwood. They're a very physical midfield group, and I, I think that does give them some chance. Interesting comment from Chris Scott pre-game talking about the importance of contested ball. Now, he said both they and the Giants, it tends to be a barometer for them. Well, the Cats tonight ended up winning the contested ball stats. Uh, not by a heap. It was 109 to 96. So one by 13. It was reasonably decisive. But, you know, Melbourne are the contestable kings, if you like. So that is going to be a crucial area in that game, I think. I agree. How about Geelong's back line, which 
tends to struggle sometimes against fleet-footed forward lines. Now, Pickett is back in good form for Melbourne and isn't Fritch certainly uh, in recent games. Doesn't he look just so good? Now, who do they play on Fritch? Um, well, it's got to be someone who's agile enough, but someone who has decent aerial ability. Uh, I don't know. I would have thought Zach Tui could go all right on him. Someone well, I think of that ilk. Zach Tui likes the freedom of being less accountable. Well, that's true. Um, and do um, we worry about Zach Tui? Duncan was great last week, first game back. Much quieter tonight. Tui's had about a month off. Sometimes hard to come up second up after a hemi. Well, that's true. Duncan seemed to play forward uh, pretty exclusively tonight. Maybe they were aware of that. And, you know, maybe he's going to have a bigger crack through the midfield next yep. week. They've certainly got some options there. Um, let's keep going. Grant King says, Max Holmes is a player. His uncle, a six-times Victorian 100-metre sprint champ. Well, not only that, his mum is a, an Olympian and a Commonwealth Games gold medalist. So the genes, the genes are pretty good. Look, I know for a fact that Chris Scott loves him, loves his attitude, but I think mostly, as you pointed out, Fighting, loves his athleticism and endurance, and it's something that Geelong really needs. So uh, I reckon at this stage he'll probably keep his spot. Now, speaking of Commonwealth Games, do you know the player out there tonight who competed for Australia in Com Games? I don't. I think that guy Stein for GWS is a decathlete. Who went, to the right? com- went to the Commonwealth Games. Okay. Yeah, pretty one of the events wasn't haircut. Um, all right. Sorry, I'm just smiling because I'm... Uh, Richard Kershaw says, I can't recall watching a great semi-final since 2001, Port and the Hawks. Oh, I don't know. I reckon 2005, Geelong and Sydney was pretty memorable. Um, the Nick Davis game, of course. Uh, any others pop into your head in the last few years? Well... Uh, well, that, that game between the Bulldogs and Melbourne was a good game that we did on footy flashbacks. I thought that was a very good game. Uh, when was that? Um, 2000 and... Bulldogs, Sydney. Dad, Bulldogs, Sydney, 2010. Yeah, 2010. Yeah. yeah, Carlton West Coast in Perth, 2011. That was pretty good. I don't yep. know, maybe, maybe there's some obvious ones. Oh, what about um, Collingwood, Adelaide? Uh, the Jack Anthony winner. Yep. But, of course, the um, magnificence of that game uh, pretty much superseded by a viral video still resounding throughout the world. And uh, does anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the distressed Adelaide supporter interviewed by the Channel 10 news crew after the game who said, OK, I'm going to do it. The Crows were wrong, right in front of me, right in front of me. <laughs> all right. I, d- I did do that for the age once. Um, all right. Uh, Hayden Murdoch says, Hey, Roko, did you know actress Rachel Griffith was seconded in to help Jonathan Brown with his vocal delivery? Was in 2019. I guess she failed. <laughs> I don't know if you're taking the piss or you're actually serious there. <laughs> um, Suds McDuff has asked a question about how shocked we were to see an Instagram influencer snorting an unidentified white powder today um you are across that one finey i'm i wasn't overly shocked to be with a up. connection with what a geelong connection correct a former geelong connection yeah uh all right uh, let's keep going ronnie isco says richmond were hot favorites in the 2018 preliminary final and lost to the pies careful d's i think they will be pretty careful about it. I was a bit disturbed by Titus O'Reilly's tweet tonight where he was sort of questioning the ability of these two teams. I did warn him about uh, hubris. Wouldn't be showing too much hubris if I followed a side that hadn't won a flag for 57 years. But, uh, well, there you go. He's getting confident. I will Uh, say this, that whilst it is terribly unlucky and almost cruelly unfair for Melbourne supporters here in Melbourne, to be denied the chance to enjoy the run personally by watching the games at the MCG and potentially a grand final, I think it does help Melbourne because, you know, the the fever pitch that this is building up to with so many years in the wilderness, 
it's sometimes hard to suppress and for a club that becomes part I think it's a double-edged sword you love the support but everybody's tugging your your coat for tickets and the distractions are plenty so I think Melbourne might enjoy playing a couple of finals in Perth to nab a granny. I think that's a really good point um, because it's certainly one of the the bigger hoodoos we've seen in recent times haven't we and we're you know we've seen hoodoos broken we've seen uh, Sydney win their first flag for, um, how long was that? 60, oh God, 30, no, I'll come back to it. Um, Bulldogs, of course, first flag for them for, what was that, 62 years? Yep. Uh, Tigers, 37 years. You know, it's the era of breaking hooters. Yes. Yeah, City, of course. Boston uh, Red Sox, Chicago Cubs. Except et cetera, for et cetera. Rowan, of course. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Well, you had your chance. Just uh, had chances. A bit of an observation, Ro. Under normal circumstances, of course, tonight's there's every chance, and we normally would have a Friday night final at the MCG, wouldn't we, in the first week of the finals? Uh, the second week of the finals, is that not correct? Uh, Friday night final at the G, second yeah. week of the Yeah, yeah, or Friday or Saturday, yeah. Yeah. Imagine tonight. Look, I, I live on... I would have been shocking. <laughs> you, you know, I live close to the G and I was on Alexandra Avenue tonight. It's flooded. And I'm talking absolutely, at one point, impassable, virtually, you know, really impassable. I, I was in a four-wheel drive. Cars couldn't get through. God, it would have been a... a, a would have been reminiscent. What was the grand final when Collingwood beat Richmond? Uh, Collingwood beat uh, Richmond in a grand yeah. final. Yeah, like it was two goals. Richmond kicked two goals too. It was in the 20s or something. Oh, they well, somewhere between 27 and 30. Yeah, the flooding was... They shouldn't have played it, they reckon. But... Now, sorry, I've got to break in here because I'm just receiving some breaking news from um, footyology colleague Ronnie Werner, who either hasn't remembered that we're doing this or doesn't care. But he has texted to say that Jake Nile of the age has just been whacked by Chris Scott at the post-game press conference. So uh, anyone who saw that and cares to elaborate, let us know and um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, think about what happened and maybe discuss that. What right. did you take for being boring? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he was late. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe his question went on too long. Although neither of us are probably in a position to point the finger there. Uh, Ash Craven says, do you think the finals buy will be scrapped after this season? Does it still have a purpose? Well, I'm certainly hoping, Ash, that it is. I'm a, I've campaigned long and hard against it. I don't think it would have been this year were it not for the COVID situation, though. But um, I think, put it this way, I think if um, next week the two preliminary final winners are the qualifying final winners, it adds weight to the scrapping of it, the argument for scrapping it, because prior to this year, since we've had the bye, preliminary final uh, winners only four times out of 10 have been the qualifying final winners. And I think there's a fair amount of evidence that they're underdone going into those preliminary finals. So, you know, if both Melbourne and uh, Port win next week, I think it'll certainly add some credence to that argument. It's not a good thing and it should be uh, scrapped. All right, uh, Stephen Smith says, I have no doubt the AFL will flog the finals by again next year. Uh, Gavin Ward has elaborated on the press conference. He says, a massive whack. The stupid question about what it would have looked like if Jeremy Cameron was playing for GWS. Well, a stupid question. Would have, would have, I don't know. Look, it's hard to, I'm not going to, Ridicule Jake not having seen it, but um, yeah, I would have thought hypotheticals probably aren't what you want to be asking a coach at a, a post finals press conference. Uh, Ronnie Isco says he likes the questions on the right side of the screen, but please make the font bigger. Uh, Damon is uh, nodding, he's, he's going to take that on board. Um, pleasantly surprised we haven't had any uh, naughty. Uh, oh. language. Oh, Rowan, Rowan. Okay. Here no, we it's go. all right. Well, we've got facility to edit them out. It's okay. Um, 
Johnson you know, von Johnson von Trapp asking you, Fanny, are you not a fan of Jake Noir? Yeah. <coughs> oh yeah, no, no, I'm I'm very impressed by Jake. It's just that he's very methodical, and sometimes in press conferences, that sort of long road to a question can be annoying to a coach. That's the only reason I said that. Oh no, he's one of the real true journos, much in much in the style of the man that I share this very very forum with. An old school journo, I like him. He certainly knows his footy. I can absolutely vouch for Jake on that. Uh, Luke Thomas asks, can you name the last team to lose two grand finals? Not sure what you mean by that, Luke. What's can kill In a row? Uh, well, in a, I don't know. You know can get back to us, Luke. Sort of elaborate on that question. I don't quite understand it. St Kilda lost nine and ten in a row. Uh, they did. And uh, prior to them, who was the last one to lose two in a row? Collingwood. 0203 hmm. against Brisbane. Um, all right. Tim Dole says maybe someone could ask Chris Scott what he thinks about the stadium and footy in WA, like that guy did to John Longmire last week in Tassie. Did you see that, Fine? No, I didn't. Oh, it was very embarrassing. Uh, one of the local journos asked a clearly not happy John Longmire what he thought of the experience of playing a final in. Tasmania, to which the response was, mate, we just lost by one point. point. You know, have you got yep. another question? Well, that's a magnificent stadium, Rowan. Uh, what, Launceston? No. Oh, Optus Stadium. Yeah. Didn't you watch the coverage tonight? Uh, I watched the Fox footy version of it. Yeah. Every time they showed a picture of the stadium, what a magnificent stadium. Now, does Brian Taylor, has, has he been did, knocked on the head before tonight's coverage? Why? Oh, it's a magnificent stadium and we'll be enjoying it. We'll be enjoying it again tomorrow night. Then he corrected himself and goes, no. No, tomorrow night's in Brisbane. But we'll have two games here next week. Well, no. <clears throat> well, it sounded like it, they were calling from the studio again, didn't it? I guess they were. Um, we haven't talked about Eddie Maguire, incidentally. I'm not sure we should, but uh, oh, Stephen Smith wants to talk about that. What's the deal with WA singling out Eddie Maguire? What a bloody joke that is. Now, hang on, Rowan. Yes. Eddie, Eddie thinks it's a ridiculous idea, hopes WA doesn't ever get a final again, but he's not complaining about it. <laughs> well, I, I just think it's an incredibly talented family to have both his sons talented enough to work as production assistants. I mean, it's just it's amazing. You know, it certainly saves uh, time and money in terms of um, doing job interviews and stuff, doesn't it? Oh, no, that's not fair. I, that is unfair. If they do the job, production assistance, nothing glamorous, Rowan. Seriously, if they want to work in the industry and, and they do the job, then that's fair enough. That's got nothing got to do with them going to Perth to watch a game of footy, but they can work on, on programs that he works on. Why not? Well, I believe the reason he got knocked back was because he had his sons listed as production assistants. But then he said, but then he took them off and they still knocked him back. At which oh. point he was grandstanding and he was a, an easy target. <clears throat> yeah, well... But he's not complaining. Yeah, well, uh, exactly. I'm sure plenty of other people got knocked back and chose just to, to let it go. Yeah. Uh, anyway... Um, Matt Lang says, why do teams wait for the last quarter and five goals down to take the game on? The first three quarters were pretty boring. I thought the third quarter was all right. I mean, you had uh, how many goals kicked in the third quarter? Six, seven goals. Um, three, five, five to the Cats, two to the Giants. Look, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great game. It wasn't a great game. Um, I think you'd expect the Brisbane Bulldogs game to be a lot more entertaining, wouldn't you? Oh, that, that game could really hit the heights. First of all, you get a really engaged full house up in Brisbane. <clears throat> Secondly, the Bulldogs, look, they've got some star turns in that team. They had Caleb Daniels under a bit of a clip, though. That would make a huge difference. Yeah, it would. Huge, huge difference. Oh, they cannot afford to not have him. That would be like Daniel Rich not playing. So important to how they move the ball out of the back line. I'd be watching that very carefully. But I just think that there's 
you know, there's more entertainment expected in that game. I, I, you know, as good as it is Hawkins and Cameron, they're big boys, whatever. So when the ball goes down there and there's Cameron and McCarthy up one end and, and you've got the bond and that, I just expect a lot more from that game, actually. Yeah, I, uh, we'll, we'll do a bit of a preview of that um, shortly when we get to our, our tips for that game. Um, just an observation from Dan Kadui. Hope I've got that right, Dan, but he's talking about Melbourne Storm. Storm rested a few players tonight, even with the minor premiership on the line. The buy needs to be there. I don't enjoy it, but it means you play your best side in the last game. I, I take that on board, Dan, but I don't think that's as important as sides which have been good enough to finish top four and good enough to win their first final being adequately prepared for their shot to get into a grand final. And that's what you fight all season for. And I think there's plenty of evidence that too many teams that have been in that position have been underdone and have been jumped by sides that have played week in, week out. Uh, examples, Sydney, uh, Geelong against Sydney in the 2016 preliminary final, seven goals to one the opening term. Collingwood against Richmond, 2018, Tigers' best side all year. Rabbit in the headlights stuff in the first half, game over. 2019, when Collingwood won their qualifying and GWS got out to a you know five goals plus lead before Collingwood finally woke up and nearly pinched the game. So um, I, I just think one set of priorities certainly outweighs the other. Uh, just on. Yeah, go, go on. Go on. Go on. Can you imagine with 15 seconds to go, the game at 28-16, a key Melbourne player got reported, went on report, as they say in the NRL. Uh, well, yeah. What, what are you getting at? Sorry. No, how stupid that is. 15 seconds to go in the game. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah. Okay. How did you manage to watch that as well as the semi-final? A Solomona or whatever. He's one of the big forwards, but he's a key man. And... Like, because of his record, he's been up there four times or something, he can't get any discounts. If he's guilty, he'll miss the first week of the finals. 15 seconds to go in the game. Crazy. How come, how come their finals are two weeks? Oh, yeah, okay, they're normally... Actually, it's normally the same weekend, isn't it? That has no, been. It's after. It's normally how... a week, week later. Are you yeah. sure? Yeah. Uh, well... 2015, I think, or 16, when um, the North Queensland Cowboys won with the Thurston kick. That was the day after our grand final. There's been plenty that have been the day after. I don't know. Maybe they chop and change it. Oh, Dan Kadui, thanks, Dan, has said, we missed the bye. So, and, we, and that'll come back a week anyway, presuming we have that pre-grand final bye, which appears like it's locked in. Actually, we haven't really talked about that. I wonder what sort of impact that's going to have. I mean, it's the same for both teams, obviously, so it, it's a level playing field, but I wonder in terms of you know momentum and building the atmosphere, I, I suppose I just worry that two weeks is a fraction too long to try and string it out. I mean, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I, I don't like it at all. It just plays with the natural order of form and and routine. Why, you know, the players are used to a routine and I think they play their best football in that routine. And shouldn't we be trying to create a fixture that sees the best football played possible during the finals? I don't think a buy adds to that at all. Okay, it, so, well, why are we... Ha oh, man, I'm, there's something I'm missing here. Why are we having it then? Because... Surely the winner of tomorrow night's game can head straight to Perth. Yeah, but just in case, with Port Adelaide, so next week, Port Adelaide are playing in South Australia. Yeah. And I think it was to guarantee that whoever wins that game... Oh, uh, gets the two-week quarantine. Yeah, can yeah, go. Okay. okay, yeah, well, I mean, it, it's something... I wonder if, you know, if I it's... Think, I think the way demanded it. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I wonder if it's seen to work, whether people might start asking if that becomes a permanent thing. But, you know, I, I don't think there's enough reason to do it. People might say, oh, you know, one team, if one team gets wiped, you know, they were too tired and 
you want to freshen them up, but uh, no, I, I think the cons outweigh the, the pros in that one. All right. Um, I just want to, Jeff Ward's come in here. There's a potential X factor that nobody has spoken about that could have a major effect on who wins this year's flag. I'm talking about a player failing an HIA in a prelim. That's a rugby league thing, isn't it? That's a head knock, right? And being automatically stood down for the grand final. While I truly hope it doesn't happen, it did in last year's AFLW preliminary to the captain of Adelaide. Hmm. Well, it'd be unfortunate, obviously, but you can't dismiss the protocols surrounding concussion just because it's a grand final, can you? But it's okay because in a preliminary final, if it happens... Oh, you get the two weeks, the 12 days, yeah. They'll have enough time to play. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. So, uh, you know, if someone does get... I mean, provided it's not a really, really bad one, um, you could get concussed, have the mandatory 12 days, and if you side one still playing the grand final. So it at least alleviates that. Maybe that's what you're getting at, Jeff. Sorry if I've got that wrong. And if it's a really bad one, they shouldn't be playing it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Dan again points out that Super Bowl has the week off before. Um, then we've got to do it. Johnson Von Trapp says, did the two, asking me if the two weeks break went against Essendon in 1990, did it what? In fact, it wasn't just a two weeks break because they rested a lot of players for that last game. Uh, so they missed that one, then didn't play in the first week of the finals, then missed a second week because Collingwood and West Coast had to have a replay. So some Essendon players went virtually a month without playing um, and they were competitive in the first half of that second semi and then lost by 10 goals and they were cactus after that. Some players went more than a month without playing. Yeah, um, I don't know. I've tried to sort of uh, banish all those memories from from my mind. Uh, you wouldn't believe this. We're actually up to date on the questions and we've run out of questions. So what's going on here, people? Get some questions through, get some comments through. They'll all get read. They'll certainly appear on the feed and be seen by an audience of hundreds of thousands of people. We're going to do a... Oh, Damon Dame, has... Damon has jazzed up the uh, user interface. So bigger text, pictures, um, your headshot. You can get your headshot on the feed. So get a question in. You get your name mentioned. You get people in Botswana having a look at it. I mean, I'm going to do what the AFL do about the grand final. This live stream is being seen by 37 billion people around the globe simultaneously. It's incredible. Um, all right, uh, while Panda is asking me if Twitter existed in 1990, how would your meltdown have been said with cheeky respect for you? And while Panda, I say with cheeky respect to you, get stuff. Um, yes, it's true. I had a bit of a meltdown on Twitter on Sunday night. Finey, do you want me to explain why I had a bit of a meltdown? No, no, I followed it a bit because I, I read your apology. Then I went and read all the people going, no, you're right, mate. You were right. No, I know. Well, yeah, it was a look. No, I did. I did genuinely apologize because there are a couple of people I was completely over the top to. It did have a strategic, um, uh, strategic component to it because people love apologies. It's part of the Australian way fighting. You stuff up, you apologize, and everyone goes, ah, oh, good on you. Good on you for owning it. Good on you for owning those six murders and, you know, beheading of that uh, little girl's dog, you're forgiven. Now, what happened was I stupidly tweeted something about how the Bulldogs had got five of their first seven goals from free kicks after one particularly dodgy Cody Waitman one. Of course, it came back to bite me because I tweeted that when the scores were pretty much level and then the Bulldogs ended up winning by 50 points or whatever it was. And then people started throwing it in my face like I was blaming the loss on the umpiring which was crap. So I started trying to say, well, did you have a look when I tweeted that? And then after about the 500th of them, I got sick of saying it. So I started throwing in a few expletives and the one poor bloke copped both barrels and I used several expletives in the one tweet. So I thought it was best I clear that up. But uh, I was actually trending at one stage. And um, I can tell you tonight, and I'm sure Nadia Bartel can... Uh, agree wholeheartedly that uh, nine times out of ten, if you see a name trending on Twitter, it's not good. All right. Um, reminds me, 
Nadia Bartel incident yeah. reminds me of, you know, this is, have you seen the film clip for this is serious mums? Um, he ain't going to be, you know, old, old man. Never River. be an old man river. Uh, seen the, I don't think the, I have, no. The film clip starts, you know, with them in the in, in usual tism crazy garb. Yep. Thing. Now, a warning to all young people watching this music video. Don't do drugs. Do not do drugs. And then they go... I think that went pretty well. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I thought that came along pretty well. Okay, great. Which is why we probably didn't see that clip on uh, uh, Hey Hey at Saturday or one of those shows. Um, good one here from, uh, before we get too far off the rails, good one here from Larry Hill. Says, how did the Bulldogs beat Melbourne last time? They played Bont as a half forward to make Weaver accountable. Menegola to do this role, in my view. Good observation. Um, and Minigola is a proven goal kicker, isn't he? In fact, you know, the early, probably that first season and a half he played for the Cats, he was probably more a half forward with spells in the midfield than the midfielder he is now. So um, he's they handy do, near goals. They do, they do need some other goal kickers, don't they? The Cats? Yeah, they need something coming out of the middle. We know Mitch Duncan can kick goals, but they are becoming heavily reliant on that front two, three forwards, you know, Rowan lesser, but still two tonight, Cameron and Hawkins to kick the bulk of their goals. They would love Menegola to kick two or three next week. Well, what about given his, you know, seeming sort of average form of late, what about Dangerfield as a permanent forward? Not with a broken hand, I wouldn't have thought. Well, I mean, if yeah, a, a, if he's incapable of taking a mark, you know, should he even be playing? Well, by the way, he did he did end up tonight, Danger, with um he got better. He ended up with 21 disposals. In fact, I'll just read through the disposal count. So Zach Two ended up with 31 tonight, Menegola 29, Cam Guthrie 25, Smith 23, Duncan 22, Dangerfield 21. Uh, Tomahawk, 19 disposals, eight marks. Reese Stanley, 19. Actually, that's an interesting one. I know you had Mumford in your best, but uh, Geelong won the hitouts pretty decisively, 43 to 33. And I thought Stanley wasn't too bad tonight. It was okay. It was all right. Um, I mean, he's good enough for him to stick with him. They're not going to drop yeah, him, yeah, of surely. Course, of course. And how many did Selwood get tonight? <clears throat> Uh, not enough for me to write him down, so less than 19. Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, 21's a fail for a modern midfielder, to be honest, if you're on the ball most of the night. He's an interesting one, He's because he, uh, my memory is he started off this season in fantastic form, but he, he really has sort of fallen off the pace yeah. of the, the back half. Yeah. Um, I'll just go through, I'll go through the Giants quickly too. Lockie Whitfield, great game from him tonight, 34. Hopper, 28. Kelly, 25. DeBoer, 22. So actually in that tagging role in Dangerfield, but had more of the ball. Ward, 22. Ash, 21. He's a good player. And Nick Haynes, 21. They even got thrown forward and kicked a goal for them in that last quarter. Gee, he's been a great player for them, hasn't he? So consistent. Yeah, very good. You know, that early on, and I can see a really bright future for Tanner Brune. Did yep. a couple of really nice things. He's strong over the ball. Same with Ash, same with Cumming. I think they've got some, a bright future. When you consider that Buckley was tracking very well as a tall defender, such a pity he did his knee, that with Sam Taylor and Buckley, very young players to be looking to the future for in terms of tall defenders. And they got, they, I reckon their back line is rebuilt well. Isn't it nice to see they're just a normal team now? Not made up of top 10 picks or feeling that they deserves star billing. It's just an even spread of really hard workers and they show great character this season. The only thing uh, you really... A club like that really deserves good following and that's something that they I don't think we'll ever get in well, our life. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say they'll ever... I wouldn't say categorically they won't. It, it takes time. I mean, that you know, they, they work very hard in the region. I know that. And the supporters they do have, and I know a few, they are absolutely dedicated, as you would be with a 
a small fan base, but um, I don't know. It'll, you know, it, like I said, it takes time. I mean, they've only been in existence. This is what their tenth season in the AFL um, in foreign, relatively foreign football territory. So, yep. uh, you know, winning a few flags and constantly appearing in finals will certainly help them. Um, here's a different one. Uh, Ronnie Isco asking for our comments on Ross Lyon opting out of the Carlton coaching role. Uh, very interesting. Not a great look for Carlton. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what my thoughts about it, and you give yours, Fanny. I think there's a really interesting contrast with how Collingwood's gone about getting their coach and how the Blues have. What I like about what Collingwood did is the fact that they finally sort of recognised hey, we're not a huge club anymore. We're certainly not in terms of on-field success. They've won two flags in 70 years. Yes, they have a big following, but there's certainly an air about that club that the uh, the sizzle exceeds the quality of the sausage. And I think it was pretty notable with Eddie gone that they kept it almost deliberately sort of low-key. I like the fact that they've appointed Craig McRae. He's a very atypical Collingwood appointment, isn't he? You think about all their coaches, Buckley, Malthouse, Shaw. Um, who's before Shaw? I just had a complete blank. Uh, Matthews. Matthews. Um, even John Cale, a big coaching name from South Australia. You know, Bob Rose. Uh, like, he, he is the least Collingwood well, exactly. He's the least uh, Collingwood-type coaching appointment they've, they've arguably ever had. And I think it means it's them saying, look, we're concentrating on the footy. We want a good coach. We don't want a big PR splash. We just want to start winning games of footy, get our act together, and become a successful club that people respect for what it achieves on the field. Carlton, I think, has had periods of trying to do that. But this whole latest debacle, and it's rapidly becoming one, it's them sort of reverting to the Carlton of type and they haven't even been able to do that properly because they clearly thought they were going to land either Clarkson or Lyon and now it looks like they end up with neither of them. It is interesting that Ross pulled the pin. I mean, it's hard not to conclude that he pulled the pin because he was miffed that they sought him out and then were going to make him go through this process and he sort of thought, well, if you're going to seek me out, why should you then subject me to that? So... I think he pulled the pin, Rowan, because he read the jungle drums and did he really want to be publicly, to miss out on the job for the reason that members of the Carlton board were very uncomfortable with that incident at Fremantle involving him and a staff member of the opposite sex. So I don't think he wanted that rehashed. And quite frankly, you know, for Carlton to sort of sound him out and then to start to have second thoughts on that score is very unprofessional. That should have been... If they if they had concerns there, his name should never have been brought up. Now, since he's dropped out, they've apparently decided to have another go at Clarkson, who has said no already. They made an informal query of Nathan Buckley, who said no thanks. They're now apparently going down the Brad Scott route because they're incapable of imagining at the moment that David T could be replaced by somebody else who had done the right apprenticeship and might not have a big name. Am I, I just can't believe I'm saying this. Is part of the selection group David Parkin and Greg Williams? Yeah. Who do they want to cut Don Nichols? Well, again, that's that's Carlton what being Carlton. We, what? Seriously? I mean, Parker was great. Um, Greg Williams has had a much publicised and very unfortunate post-football career because of concussion issues. I don't know. I find the whole thing very unusual, Rob. Well, I, I, I don't have any great objection to Dave Parkin being involved because he, he's still, you know, he, he's very academic in his approach to footy and he's still right across it. But what it says to me is you want someone who is familiar with the politics and the inner workings of Carlton. And the fact that you need someone like that indicates that you've got a club which is still sort of stuck in that old way of operating. And 
Um, you know, I, th I think they've tried this. I mean, we don't want to get stuck on this, but they've tried it. The various administrations have tried to become more contemporary. Brenda Bolton was a, 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 a non-Carlton-like appointment. Even David Teague was to an extent. Wayne Britton probably was. But they always inevitably get brought down by those sort of, you know, Carlton influences, be they former players or corporate interests or whatever. And it's sort of, again, the club reverting to type. And this is also pretty embarrassing for the new president, Luke Sayers, because he was the one who was basically flagging Ross Lyon and it appears like he didn't have his board on side with him. So, geez, get your get your um, <laughs> get your ducks in a row before you're going to go public and sort of you know look like you're you're revealing something, and then all of a sudden you find half your board doesn't want them. The selection committee at Carlton for the new coach should be John Elliott, Bruce Matheson, and via seance Richard Pratt. Well, I was going to say Ian Rice, maybe. Is he still with us, Ian Rice? Um, if Malcolm, not, the same Mal sale. Malcolm Fraser certainly isn't, but maybe I could get him by a silence as well. Uh, good comment here for you. Um, James Taylor, uh, who doesn't need a friend, I'm sure he's got plenty, <laughs> <laughs> um, says, oh, sorry, that was pretty obvious, wants to ask you, Fanny, how do you read Jungle Drums? Braille? No. <laughs> um, yeah, that, well, you know, the jungle drums were beating. So I, I, I think it's a form of communication that is red. All right, we'll let you off that one. Uh, Wild Panda has just randomly written that Matthew Knights is balls deep. No idea what that is alluding to, and I don't think I want to know. Um, Grant King says, I've worked there. They like big names. They certainly do. Robert Rice asking, what about Mark Williams as Carlton coach? No. I, I don't, I just, yeah, I think Choco is now in that sort of space where he's a more a mental figure than a, uh, you know, a number one coach. I mean, that might be a bit unfair. I mean, he's still coaching, isn't he? He was coaching Ajax, wasn't he? Wasn't he coaching Ajax? Or? Yeah. Up in tears, I believe. Oh, did it? Yeah, okay. I mean, he's yeah, that's what I mean. He's pretty sort of old school, um, and I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, here's another one on the coaching. Richard Kershaw says they should ask Peter Sumich because everyone suggests that when a coaching gig comes up. Yep. Uh, less so in recent years. Uh, Leroy Jones taking issue with your comment about Diesel Finey. He says he's just signed a huge business deal for his company. His brain is sharp as a knife. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that, I mean, that's that's good, but that's not what has been portrayed in the media, that he has had, you know, severe problems because of concussion during his football career. So that's great. I'm pleased to hear that. All right. Uh, Stephen Smith says, Gary Ayres is coaching Montrose. Yeah, I, I heard that. Really? Oh, good. I like the. Uh, I've had a bit of a connection with the guys from Montrose over the last ten years or so. So that's a bit of a coup for them. The Duke of Montrose. Um, oh, so Wild Panda say Matthew Knights is into the Carlton job seriously. Okay. There All is right. no way they would have Matthew Knights as coach. He's been very low key in that assistance role. At Geelong, definitely. Yeah. Um, Damien, just a quick one to you. I'm hearing myself in my earphones, which is pretty disconcerting. Oh, okay. Now, he's da uh, da Damien's watching me on his phone. He just can't get enough of me. Well, you're only human. Um, Gary Butterfield says, not the biggest footy matter going around, but GWS charcoal away kit looks good. Simple, always best. Great comment, absolutely, yeah. and and don't, doesn't that respectfully give us a contrasting Guernsey that doesn't clash? They wore that top against Sydney. Now, one of the worst clashes just happened to be GWS and Sydney because from behind they all look the same. Mm. But of course, they're not beholding to 140 years of monochromatic selfishness. 
Yeah, it's a um, so yeah, no, I agree. It, there was great, uh, what do we call it? Uh, uniform differentiation tonight. There's a Twitter account called um, Jumper Clash Golf or something, and they award pars and bogeys, and they were very happy. I think they scored that one an eagle or an albatross, even they were very happy with that. But why didn't GWS wear that one when they played Geelong in round 21? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if someone at the AFL saw that game and just went, oh, we should have wearing the charcoal. It just seems very ad hoc. There often doesn't seem to be any rhyme or someone reason to it. AFL, somebody at the AFL, all I, can, all I have to say on that matter is Adelaide St Kilda AFLW. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that was appalling. <laughs> I remember that. That was an absolute shocker. Uh, Digby Norton says, could I just say the GWS owe a great deal of respect or are owed a great deal of respect for never giving up in finals. I'm thinking last week against the Swannies, two years ago against the Pies, even tonight, often just hanging in their credit. I think they deserve a reputation for such cutthroat style. What do you think? Disagree. They Disagree. fill in a hole against the Swannies and they stop to an absolute walk against Collingwood. But weren't you just praising their resilience yeah. about five minutes ago? No, no, I'm just saying that they're not two good examples. You're not turning into Kane Corns here, are you? Well, hang on. I'm just saying they're not two great examples. That against Sydney and Collingwood, they fell in. That they weren't the teams that showed resilience. Oh, they did at the end last week against the Swans. They were under absolute bombardment. Yeah, they, you know who their best player was in the last 15 minutes? Uh, the Post. Correct. I knew, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> You're becoming so contrarian, Fine. I'm going to start calling you Kane. You're like, you, you've forgotten what your position was when you contradict it five minutes later. No, no. no. Incidentally, on that, this is a serious oh, one. Yeah, no, this is a serious one. On our podcast on Wednesday, we discussed Toby Green. I gave you the chance to modify your stance on Toby Green, but you doubled down and you still thought that he shouldn't have been suspended. No, I said I understood why he got suspended because of the message it gives. But I believe there was absolutely no intent in it. And the umpire wasn't threatened by it. And he brushed past somebody. And I understand how this game works and his reputation. And I understand the voice of public opinion. And GWS has is mute in that department. Mute, I tell you, because when that incident happened, Rowan, I'm telling you, this is a fact. In the immediate immediate hour after that game, there were many um, contradicting points of view in the media. I, I, I know this. There were people that said he could get off, he might not get off, he could get 10 weeks. Within a couple of days, and the resounding public voice against him, nobody was speaking on his behalf. Now, that's true. I'm, I'm tipping 90% of the initial views saying he should get off were former players. Okay, but they, all of them changed their mind because they because the public voice against him was enormous. Yeah, I'll just, say, I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, I, I, know what you, I know what you're getting at, but if you're saying that, you know, there was no intent or like he wasn't going to hurt him or whatever, then you're setting a pretty high bar for when there is an incident like that. I mean, you know, unless you do what John Burke did to umpire Phil Waite and push him over, when are you going to get rubbed out? If, you, if you're allowed to sort of run into him and sort of basically shove him or, you know, barge them out of the way, which is what he did. I don't think he did. He said, I don't think he did that. If he did that, Absolutely. But he did. His shoulder made contact with him. He did, but he didn't. He just sort of, it made contact with him. Well, you amazingly made contact with the camera lens. For an an umpire to come out and say he completely, and look, you might think that it's odd that I would defend him. I mean, I I, I used to umpire him in the ammos. Well, you used to hit the players. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. No, but I'm saying... For an AFL umpire to come out when asked and say, no, I didn't feel in any way threatened. I didn't think there was anything in it. Is that what he said? Did Stevie say there wasn't anything in it, though? Yeah. yeah. Well, Mm. look, he said I didn't feel threatened in any way. 
and I think he said there wasn't much to it or something along those lines. For him to come out and say that, doesn't that say something? Um, yeah, but I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. And I understand why he got suspended. Yeah. Because of the, of the, you know, the ripples when you throw a stone in the water. You know, the, 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 this thing is bigger than just that game and the following game, you know, the game against Geelong or whatever. So it's it is. It's, it's important symbolically. It is yeah. important. It is. I understand that. Okay. Well, let's, you know. Let's, I feel like it's pretty, I feel that he, you know, no intent, a minor brushing of two people coming together. It's funny, isn't it? Oh, okay. Well, you know what? I'm now very clear on it. So maybe it's a good thing. No, okay, I, I, I'd say this. We all agree that standards have tightened up on all disciplinary things in the modern era. I don't think what Greg Williams did to Andrew Coates in 1997 was any worse than what Green did to Stevic, and he got nine games for that. That was off the charts, wasn't it? Oh, well, in terms of power, yeah. Well, Carlton ended up but, challenging it in, at court, the time in court. We about it. Say that again. I was shocked at the time. Yeah, it was a, it was a very draconian penalty, and and Carlton challenged it, and and I think they won, or they had it reduced, I think, to seven weeks, or I, I, it's hard to remember. But I mean, but my point, my point is, if if it was deemed ser- that was deemed serious enough in nineteen ninety seven, there's no way they're going to say this is any less serious now. And he, no. and but they did really he got three. Anyway, let's was, move on. Was, was Williams also carrying the can a bit for a career of umpire hating? Yeah, possibly. Possibly. Um, I remember seeing it live, actually, and, and thinking, I, I didn't sort of make too much of it at the time. And then I got home and I realised, oh, yeah, okay, that is going to be a big deal. And it was a big deal. Went to court and ended up dragging through most of the season. Um, all right. I reckon... Uh, we can revert back to some questions if anyone has a particularly good one, but I think we should probably do our tips now. And we only have one tip this week, and that, of course, is for the uh, first semi-final at the Gabba tomorrow evening, played between Brisbane and the Western Bulldogs. Start time, I'm pretty sure, is 7.20pm. Um, Finey, what is your tipping device? i got a Name a player that played for both teams but played more games for the team that you're tipping and you can give the clue of initials of that player. All right. Okay. So, uh, all right. We're after a player who played for both teams, played more games for the team you are tipping. And so, to broaden it out a bit because we've only got the one game. Yeah. Brisbane Lions include Brisbane Lions, Brisbane Bears and Fitzroy. Oh, really? Yeah, that, that sort of means we can flesh it out a bit. Okay. Um, questions. There's some big names there in that case. All right, would you like to go first? Yeah. There's a guy and I can't remember his name. <laughs> okay, that's a good start. I've got a couple clear ones. They're pretty obvious. Uh, I'll go J.O. Okay, J.O. Um, really? <laughs> Jay, hey. Oh, Jason Ackermanis. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go. So the guy I was thinking of was that he had a reputation of being a really sort of greedy footballer. He used to like kicking goals. He played mainly for Brisbane, went to the ball. Yeah, that's it. Well done, Damo. Justin Sherman. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. We've got plenty of suggestions coming through. Um, I'm trying to think of one who... Uh, it's not coming to me. It was a... Oh, yeah. Hang on. Um, no, I might have it wrong, though. Uh, I can't remember his first name. <laughs> he, was a, he was a goal kicker, and he ended up at the Bulldogs. And I'm pretty sure he played more for them. Oh, God. All right. Now I've got one. I, I've got to go with one that's fairly obvious. Uh, DH. 
ended up at the doggies, but mainly Brisbane. No, you said the criteria oh, yeah. was played more Doug games. Hawkins. Doug Hawkins. Yeah. All right, so, we've got we've yeah, got, Bernie, got some more. Yeah, go on. Bernie Quinlan, he would have played more for Fitzroy, did he? Uh yes, he yeah. did. Uh, I've got uh, some good suggestions coming through. Richard Osborne. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, who else we got? Brad Hardy. That's a good one. Um, that's from Tim Dahl. How about Ben Hudson? Uh, no one sent that through yet. Uh, Ryan did. Uh, BH. Uh, Leroy Jones. GC. Finey. Can you remember that one? Um, uh, very, very good nickname. Glenn Coleman. Yes. Nickname? He was Galaxy. Correct. He was the first player to do what? Um, I don't know. Play oh. your more games for three clubs. Uh, he played for the Swans as well. Yep, yep. So first player ever to play 50 games or more for three clubs. And who was the second? How many games or more for three clubs? 50 or more for three 50 clubs. 50 or more for three clubs. <laughs> Who was the second? Yeah. Uh, um, no, I don't know. Oh. Premiership player, I think, at one of the clubs. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Fremantle, I think. Oh, Lee Brown. Uh, all right, uh, here's one from Wild Panda. Good one, SA. SA, yep. Um, he had a brother who also played Atkins, yeah. Simon Atkins, yep. Um, what about this one, JS? Uh, Josh Shackey. Correct. SM. Stephen Martin. Uh, I don't think Nick Cat fan, you've got the hang of this. We're talking about a tip for the Brisbane uh, Bulldogs <laughs> game. <laughs> Nick Cat fan. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Nick. That was about the... He's saying, did Darren Jolly play 50 games for three clubs? I think he might have. Mm. No? Well, how many did he play for Melbourne? Not 50. You sure? Pretty All sure. Right. Damon's looking that up. You happy with uh, that? What about, about, one. So what about uh, PF, Fine. PF? Yeah. Peter Francis. No. Uh, no. No. Um, Close the Bulldogs. No. PF. Um, 48 for Melbourne, Darren Jolly. Just missed the cut. Bad luck. What well, good Mark, suggestion though, Nick. Mark Kellett went close, but no cigar. Mark Kellett went close. Mark Kellett was also the bass player in one of my favourite bands, Mio 245. Different Mark Kellett. It was P- a different Mark Kellett. Um, uh, good player. Peter Foster. Correct. Okay. How uh, about D? How about what? MD. Uh, um... Mark Drosher. Played for Sands. Mark Dreyer. Played for who? Oh, Drosher. Played for Frankston. Yeah, David Drosher. David Drosher. And what was your suggestion? This is just word association now. Come on. I think it's time to wrap it up. Other places, says Johnson Van Trapp. Of course, Mio 245's first single off their one and only album. Lady Love. That was their first single. Wasn't on the album, though. And uh, a, a, cr- a criminally ignored second single called uh, "Marching Feet." So yeah, MD a defender for both teams, I think. Uh, era nineties, I'm guessing. Mm. No, Matthew Dent. Ah, uh, someone did suggest him before, actually. Um, so Nick Cat fans come back with those numbers on Darren Jolly. 48 for Melbourne, 117 for the Swans, and 71 for the Magpies. Mm. Uh, Johnson Von Trapp's got another one here, um, Finey. BD. 
BD. No, he didn't play for... No, I don't think that's right, Johnson. I don't think BD played for... He played for the Bulldogs and he played for St Kilda, didn't he? Bruce DeBruzel. Correct. No, I never played for Fitzroy. Man. No, I didn't think so. Uh, Michael McLean, another good one from... Yeah, uh, Richard yeah. Kershaw wants to know, did Barry Hall get 50 at St Kilda or the Bulldogs? Not the Bulldogs. Let me see. He had at least a couple of seasons at the Doggies, didn't he? Yeah, I don't think he got 50 at the Doggies, though. Yeah, okay. Oh, good one. 39 for the Doggies, Barry Hall. Good one from ZT, Jimmy Edmund. Yeah, that's right, for the Bears. He was captain, wasn't he? He was captain of the Bulldogs when they uh, made the preliminary final in 85. Anyway, um, oh, the extension. <laughs> Leroy Jones remembers my nickname for Jed Adcock. That was one of the... I, te- I reckon I've come up with some of the great nicknames and they've never caught on. That was my finest. Don't you reckon that's a pretty good nickname? Adcock, the extension. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not bad. I was right. Well, it was it was on a on a par with um, Callum and Brendan Archie, the sneeze and the sniffle. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Uh, um, I was yeah. I was the Lou Richards of my time. Uh, all right, I reckon we should go. <laughs> We're just talking <laughs> drill now. Yeah. Used to play for Brisbane. Who? Moody. They had a player called Moody. Surname was Moody. Tom? No. Peter? No. Moody and Enigmatic? Anyhow, there was this piece of play where I think Moody and Adcock were going for the ball. And the commentator was commentating, said, that reminds me, I've got to ring my wife after the game. (laughs) I I don't get it. Well, he, it reminded him of his wife, Moody, and then. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. Um, all right. Uh, I reckon we wrap it up here. Um, how long? Yeah, we've been going long enough. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's good fun tonight. Hope you liked our new user friendly interface, courtesy of Wonder producer Damon Jackman. Hey, Damon, can you, uh, speaking of Damon Jackman, Damon, can you put up the Patreon link, please? Now, all you people on here, I know all your names, I know where you live. It's time you put your hand in your pocket and became an official footyology patron. Do you want this to continue or not? I believe you do. There's only one way to guarantee that happens, and that is to fork out a measly, a trifling, a pittance of $7 Australian per month. It's not going to fund a great holiday house for either of us. It's not going to Nadia Bartel's drug dealer. It's going... To allegedly. allegedly, sorry, sorry. It's going to keep this operation going. So please, and I, I know I'm sort of being lighthearted about it, but we really need the money. So um, if you're not a subscriber and you like what we do and you like the website and the live streams and the podcasts and everything, please, seven bucks a month. We'll be eternally grateful, I promise. Um, while Panda's asking, are we going to do this after each final now? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, we'll talk about it. There's only three games left in the season, isn't it? We're certainly going to do a post-grand final one. Um, there's a Friday night preliminary. So we'll we'll talk, Fanny. Let's see if we do a, a, a post-Saturday night preview one as well. Uh, and but that's what I'm getting at, people. See, this costs money. Um, Damon's fees have gone through the roof. No, they haven't. They haven't. He's very reasonable. But... Um, you know, help it helps us pay for this stuff. So, uh, uh, Wild Panda already pays his seven bucks. Thank you, Wild Panda, uh, etc. So, Scott's on. Thanks, Scott. Um, all right. Yeah. No, no. Look, in all seriousness, really appreciate the support. Okay. What's coming up at Footyology? So, we've got the podcast review of both finals. We'll be recording that uh, probably reasonably early on Sunday. So, that should be up in reasonable time on Sunday. Um, We've got uh, the midweek edition, um, which will be a preliminary final preview. And um, if you want to catch us elsewhere, well, Finey, uh, what are you doing over the rest of the weekend? You'll be, Finey will be 
Father's Day. But oh, is it this weekend? Yeah. Oh my god. Um, hey, by the way, I think I've bought a new place to live. Tonight. Oh, good. Well, I think so. That's uh, my offer's been verbally accepted. So, do you want an inter- do, you want, do you want me to give you an interesting football fact before we go? Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure this is right. Prior to the year 2000, yeah. only two players or two people who had played for Geelong coached another club in the in, in a hundred over a hundred years. Prior to when? About two thousand. Uh, one of them, Bill Goggin. Correct. Who coached Footscray as well as Geelong. Yep. yep. Uh, and the other one's probably, you know. No, same sort of era. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Rod Olsen didn't coach Hawthorne, did he? No? Um, no, he Geelong. He was from Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, hang on. Um, same club. Same club. Yeah. What do you mean, same club? Billy Goggin. Oh, oh, um, not Bluey Hampshire. He didn't coach Geelong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't coach Geelong, did he? No, he coached the Bulldogs. Yeah, but he didn't coach Geelong. No, I said only two ex Geelong players. Only two. Oh, people. sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Bluey yeah. Hampshire. Huh? They're the only two people who played for Geelong who ever coached other clubs in over 100 years. It's remarkable. How did you come to be thinking about that at that moment? Uh, because I was, thinking of, I was thinking of Geelong's sort of influence in this coaching sphere. Still isn't very strong. Well, that's I a mean, fair point. They've had people since then, Mark Neald and your bloke at Essendon coached four games. But, they, you know, for such a powerful club, they just haven't had that. When you think of teams like Hawthorne and, and, and other clubs, Essendon and Richmond and whatever, that the, the proliferation of ex players coaching. I mean, even even Stupid St Kilda have got people going around at the moment. Well, maybe their era, you know, the golden days, it's still yet to produce those sorts of coaches. Yeah, I think it will. But I think it shows historically Geelong was a team apart, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and they've, they've produced their share of media personalities, I guess, but so are plenty of clubs. Uh, all right, on that note, yep. um, we're going to go. Oh, sorry, hang on. Wild Panda. Uh, Wild Panda has uh, pledged $100 if we do both preliminary finals, the final, final siren. Okay, Wild Panda. Um, if you can, I'll, I'll take fifty bucks. If you can get on Patreon and pledge that, I'll I'll see it, and I absolutely promise faithfully, if you do that, we will do it. So thank you very much. That is, in fact, that is fantastic, Wild Panda. Good on you. Thanks very much. Um, Must be good show. Oh, yeah. by the way, you know that stuff you were talking about last week. No, uh, you did. You you had read out a couple of texts. Of some private porno site. Oh, fans only fans. Yeah, that was weeks ago. Yeah. So did you read about it in the paper? No, what? Because they had reduced their site to only Yeah, that's what I was talking about. That's how the discussion came up. Oh, well, they've reverted it back. Oh, have they? Yeah. <laughs> you see, yeah. apparently they couldn't get funding if they were mainstream funding or 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 their value diminished because they have this pornographic element. Yeah. I don't know. Some company came up and said, no, nah, we'll cover the cost. Well, that's where all the money comes from. In fact, I, I gave it some serious... <laughs> uh, Kate's back, yeah. <laughs> I gave Kate... Now, Kate knows this because I had this discussion with Kate <laughs> that I actually approached OnlyFans yeah. to float the idea of me setting up an account and they say, yeah, but your one will have to be different. You'll actually have to pay the viewers to see you <laughs> naked. And I thought, well, oh, fair enough. Because oh, I inquired about an account and they said, yeah, we could imagine people paying for you to put clothes back on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they are the only two worthwhile gags to make about <laughs> only things. Uh, good to see you here for the duration of the show, Kate. You're a ripper. 
Um, <laughs> oh, send me another. Oh, send me oh, another DM. Oh, Shut up, Finey. Yep. Send me another DM, Kate, and we'll have a discussion about fans only. Finey, we're going. We've had hang enough. On. I know you've got your second win, but we're going. Hang on, hang on. Oh, uh, El Mc, El Mc, but yeah, I haven't seen El Mc Bell for a while. Anyway, um, oh, all right. You know yes, how you've been. What, you went back and watched Sopranos for the first time. I did. So it's been on box sets on Foxtel. So I've watched it the last couple of days. Oh yeah. And I just realised something about series, at least series two and maybe series three, that I did not realise before. What's and I wonder if it influenced you. Yeah. What in, influenced me in terms of what? They had heavy product placement for Coke. Oh, and I was correct. They were product placing Coke in that series. Um, I, no, I was totally subconscious. I actually have been drinking a bit less of it lately, believe it or not. So um, uh, I've given Coca-Cola Amatil or whatever they're called plenty yeah. of opportunity and they haven't come to the party. So anyway, but yeah. however, I can show you this. Uh, to, You're an electrician. I don't know. So I don't even know what's sitting on my desk. Um, all right. I've had enough. Last word to one no, of no, those no. people that you got involved with on Twitter on the weekend because I really like what he said. What? Can you change your nickname to Froco? Yes, yeah. We've done that joke and um, it's very, very amusing. Uh, <laughs> um, Richard Kershaw. Oh, I've got another subscriber. Who is it? Uh, Big, big sound. Thank you, big, big sound. Uh, obviously, a GWS fan, so we appreciate you. You've put aside your disappointment about tonight and got on board the footyology steam train. Wild Panda logging in now. Thanks again, Wild Panda. You're a ripper. All right, we're going to go. Thanks to your company. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week, uh, apparently twice. So uh, until then... Have a good weekend, everyone, and we'll catch you later.